This video is going to be about how you can reduce the weight in your backpack. This, this video is going to be about how you can drastically reduce the weight in your backpack so you can go do some extreme ultra lightweight backpacking. Now, most people, when they do videos on ultra lightweight backpacking, you know, one of those supreme goals would be the five pound base weight. And everyone focuses on base weight, base weight, base weight. Well, with nowadays with all the gear that's available, it's not so hard to get to the five pound base weight. And even in some months, depending on where you live, it's easy to even get below that. What those folks on the internet don't talk about is how to get rid of the weight of all that extra stuff that's not included in your base weight. So the base weight is basically everything that you carry. So it's minus your water, it's minus your food, and anything that is on you, like the shirt that you're wearing. So one of the things that I think people need to focus on more is how to reduce the weight of the food that they bring. And so this video is gonna drastically reduce the amount of weight you're gonna bring for food because it's gonna show you how you can go backpacking without bringing any food at all. That's right, this video is gonna be on backpacking without bringing any food. Now I know in another video I mentioned how you can go backpacking without bringing any water and that kind of upset people. So you just gotta hold on, watch the video, and in a couple minutes it'll all make sense and you'll feel safe and secure going into the backcountry on an ultra lightweight backpacking trip without bringing any food. And you're gonna crush that base weight every single time. Now before we go and strap on my pack, I just want to admit that this idea was not mine. I did get it from somebody else, and I'll tell you that story in a minute. Now, if you've watched one of my other videos, one of the things you might not know is that I went to college and I was a history major. I guess you can say I still am a history major. And not only that, I don't just have one history degree, I went back and got a second history degree. And so with those two degrees in history and another degree in how people think, that's not actually what they call it, it's a fancier name, but that's just what I like to refer to it as. I tend to stay up on you know all of the new developments and research and, and archaeological discoveries that are going on in the world. One of the things that I paid attention to this past summer was the discovery of a Delectamenti people uh, archaeological dig. So they were digging around where they used to live and they found hieroglyphics that were painted all on the walls and on the objects that they found. And so I set myself up to really closely analyze them with those two history degrees and figure out what was going on. And one of the things that really puzzled people over the years is how they traveled so quickly in between battles. And I was pretty sure that these hieroglyphics were going to be the key to understanding that. Now it's not easy to read hieroglyphics. But again, with those advanced history degrees, I set about to try to figure out how they did it. Now, it was probably already known that they carry little gear. Just because of the climate and where they live, they didn't need a lot of gear. But what I discovered through analyzing the hieroglyphics is that they also carried practically no food whatsoever. So I set about trying to figure out how in the world did they travel vast distances without carrying food. The discovery I made is gonna be revealed to you in a minute. One of the things they did is they had scouts go out 
and pre-scout the route. Because just like today, Google Maps and regular maps really don't tell you the whole story about exactly how long a route is going to take, how difficult it's actually going to be, what exactly the train is like. And because they knew that the soldiers were going to be coming along the same path, what they would do is stash food along the way so that these soldiers can travel fast and light. And that is what I'm going to teach you how to do today. All right, now what I'm doing now is I'm scouting out the trail that I'll be doing next weekend. So I have packed up my pack with supplies and I'm gonna teach you how to stash them properly so that they'll be ready for your ultralight backpacking trip. All right, now I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense because in order to take your ultralight backpacking trip, you have to do the trip before the ultralight backpacking trip. And like to all of you who thought that, what, where do you get off thinking that? Like, why do you go out in the outdoors? Because you love being in the outdoors. So what you're basically doing is critiquing me for being in the outdoors twice as long. But it's not twice as long, because remember, if you're scouting the trip and leaving your food, when you're ultralight backpacking, you actually move six and a half times faster than if you were bringing the weight. So if you add up the total amount of time, it's basically the same as one single ultralight backpacking trip. All right, now let's get to some of the tips and tricks here. Now, the first thing that you need is duct tape. What I recommend, especially in the winter time, is black duct tape. Because what that will do is it will absorb the heat and it will keep your food just a little bit warm. Because who wants to be eating that cold food on a cold ultralight backpacking trip, right? Now, the menu that I am stashing, I recommend that you could tweak it to your own sort of needs. So just please, these are suggestions. All right, one second. Just gotta get the bag out. All right. So the first thing that I recommend is red cabbage because even back to colonial times, red cabbage stores very well and the red cabbage has more antioxidants. And so what you wanna do is you wanna pick a nice strong tree. Kind of like, is that in the camera? Right about there? And... There. So what I've just done is I've created my first food stash. Let me get you a close-up of that. All right, so you can see the taping technique. It's just one layer over the other. And notice how there's just a little bit of wiggle room. And what that allows it to do is move with the wind. You don't want something that's so stable that it gets ripped off. You want something with just enough wiggle. All right, now let's go check out um, now let's go check out how to do some other types of stashes. So I do like putting a lot of fresh vegetables out and one of the things I like to leave out for the vitamin A because it allows me to uh, help my night vision so I don't have to bring like a, a head lantern or a, a flashlight. I could leave those at two home if I, if I eat, do enough carrots is I'll also do carrots. Now you'd think that maybe the duct tape would be the best thing for the carrot no, it's actually, it's, it's too thick and it absorbs too much heat with the orange of the carrot. So what you want to do instead is you want to go electrical tape because the electrical tape... So now, because the carrot sits so close to the tree, if the tree gets struck by lightning, it'll actually carry through the carrot and it will not be conducted by the electrical tape into the carrot. And so the last thing you want is to come out here after a lightning storm and find your carrot all blown to pieces. So electrical tape for carrots. Basically electrical tape for anything that sits close to the trees. Now this next one is a little bit of an advanced move. It's called companion stashing. So a lot of times you don't want to put certain foods together. But what you do is if you put a potato and an onion together, that onion will give some of its flavor to the potato. Now, because onions stink a lot, they will attract some wildlife every once in a while. And so by putting it into a smaller tree, notice how it moves gently with the breeze. Notice how it's moving gently with the breeze. And so what that does is it helps camouflage it from predators and potentially other people that are looking for your stashes.
Now I'm really excited to have found this stashing point. As you can see, a buck has marked this tree right here. And so one of the things that the bucks do is they will come around and they'll mark their territory. And that tends to scare off some of the animals that might want to eat something. So because the buck's already been to this tree, I'm going to stash something right here. Um, another vegetable that lasts a long time is a leek. And so I, I highly recommend using leeks in your stashes. Now, you're probably asking, Paul, you said to use electrical tape for the, for the vegetables that sit closely to the tree. Why am I not using electrical tape on the leeks? Well, the leeks don't have enough positively charged ions inside of them to conduct the electricity into the vegetable. That's why when you eat them, it's really good for antioxidant purposes. Now, seriously. Now, when a lot of people go ultra lightweight backpacking, one of the things they give up are those you know, comforting things that you would have at home, but you don't want to bring because they weigh so much. And one of the things that this method allows you to do is to bring some of those comfort foods that you would normally bring at home. So for example, if you're a big fan of the A1 steak sauce, bring it, bring it. Now, if you've noticed, I've done two things. The first is to remove the label. That allows the tape to stick to it better in case it rains. The second thing that I've done is, again, I've used electrical tape because it's glass, right? Like, of course, you're going to use electrical tape because it's glass. This is not a vegetable where you would be using the duct tape. So just remember the difference between the two tapes, please. Now, a lot of ultra lightweight backpackers will also skimp in their first aid kits, bringing just a couple of band-aids, maybe a little bit of moleskin. With this method of stashing your things ahead of the ultralight backpacking trip, there's no more skimping. Like for example, I'm gonna leave out penicillin. And you never know when you're gonna get cut, infections are gonna happen. And if you notice, this is not the regular stuff that you'd get at the doctor. You can go to your local you know, feed store and you can get this kind of penicillin. Come on, it's the same stuff they give to animals as to humans. Keep in mind, I know what I said before about the glass bottle. Now this is also a glass bottle, but if you take off the label, you won't know what the dosage is, right? Just remember that if you do use the penicillin, you need to shake it first and it needs to get to room temperature. So if you're out in like right now, it's winter camping. If I happen to need the penicillin out on my trip next weekend, one of the things that I would do is I would put it into my coat for a little while to bring it up to temperature first. So remember, shake it and bring it up to temperature. Now, if you're one of those vegan backpackers, there is a couple of other things you wanna bring. Oh, hold on, just one second. Now, if you're a vegan backpacker, I know that one of the things that you're going to want to bring are some herbs and spices and things. And so I do recommend ginger. Um, it, one of the great things is it does blend right into the tree. And then also limes. Limes are excellent for bringing uh, on a trip because you can squirt them into your water and it's, it's very refreshing. Now, let's just see if you're paying attention. I'm going to do a lime, duct tape or electrical tape. Duct tape, that's right, duct tape. Now I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, but Paul, what about some of the animals that are gonna come and take the food or possibly be aggressive to you when they think that it's their stash? So I'd like to take you back to the, the red cabbage stash that I left up here. Um, and if you notice, I've probably been on the trail, I'm on my way back right now, so it's probably been hanging up here for, I don't know, two, three hours. Notice how it's untouched, all right? Now, in case of a possible predator, like let's say, for example, there was a, a brown bear or black bear or some other kind of bear that was coming at me, every third stash, I leave some type of prote protection. So for example, let's say I was going for the cabbage. All of a sudden, right there, I spotted a bear coming right at me. Notice how easy this would be. What I would do is I move one foot 
Behind the tree, I have another stash. And I'm ready to protect my stash. Now, I'm not gonna go into the, um, I don't know, the potential moves that I would use to take down the, the predator. Um, it's probably too advanced for this particular video. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is I'll show you a, a, a tool that is maybe more comfortable in beginner's hands. Now, what we've come upon right here is one of my water stashes. Kind of bright, I don't know if you can see it or not. I can't really see anything. Um, I don't know, how's that right there? And so, what you do is you put it to the tree and then you pour your water in. And this way here, not only do you not have to worry about bringing food on the ultralight backpacking trip, you don't have to worry about bringing water. Now you're probably saying it's a very skinny tree. It is a very skinny tree and there's a reason for that because when you're ultralight backpacking, you really don't want to stop. You just want to keep moving all day long. And so what this allows you to do, now this is just for the video demonstration purposes. I would have put this on a tree without other trees behind it, so as you're walking through the trail. But all you have to do is as you're walking down the trail, so I'm walking this way, as you just bend the tree with you, and it goes right back up. And you can decide whether you want to tear it off and put it onto another tree or if you want to come back. Now if it's a dry season and there's a predator coming, now remember I said I was going to have something for you beginners for dealing with predators. Um, one of the things I recommend is, let's say you're drinking, here comes the cougar. What you do, reach behind. And you rip off a bottle of hot sauce. Now the hot sauce is very easy to disperse. It's got a big wide mouth and you just squirt it. The other thing you can do is you put some on your fingers. I mean, everyone's done this as a kid where you put water on your fingers and you go like that. You know everyone, everyone goes like that. So if you do hot sauce on your fingers, go like this. If you're doing two hands at a time in kind of a non-stop machine gun sort of fashion, you've basically created a 30 yard bubble around you of safety. And so I recommend um, the hot sauce immensely. The other good thing about this is because of the vinegar that's in this, you could leave it attached for multiple trips because it will stay fresh for a few years. So, hot sauce. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, that's all I'm really gonna show you because I think that's all you should be getting for free. Um, if you do, if you are interested in learning some of the more advanced techniques, um, I know like trail bars are very popular with people. If you wanna see how you do stash trail bars, um, camouflage is also important in some parts of the country. If you want to, show, I can show you how to bury carrots so it looks just like a garden on the side of the trail and people don't even realize that underneath there's actually the carrots that you pull out as you go. Um, there's also more advanced things like how to tape your peanuts properly so that they stay preserved. There's a certain way that you fold the tape and put it on the tree, which I'm not gonna show you in this video. Um, that is for the, the paid course uh, only. So if you're interested in that, um, you can contact me about uh, being a part of that paid course. All right, so I'm gonna be heading back and uh, <clears throat> next week I'll be doing my ultralight hike on this route. Um, maybe I'll shoot a video of it, probably not since I'm not going to bring a camera because that wouldn't be true ultralight backpacking. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is I'll go on the trip next week and then I'll shoot one after that. Um, I'm hoping that everyone was able to get at least one tip or trick from this video. Um, I hope that everyone gains a little bit of confidence in being able to do this sort of thing on your own. And uh, if anybody has a tip of their own on how to ditch some of that weight from your backpack, please leave it in the comments below. Um, one of the things that I'm considering doing a video on that, again, I just don't see enough videos out there on this, is I think we need another word, like there's base weight, that's the stuff you carry. I think we need another word for the stuff that is on your body. 
Um, like I think people are way too overdressed while going over an ultralight backpacking. And so one of the things I'm considering doing a video on is ditching the clothes when you backpack and how to safely do that. Um, the other thing that I see too many people do is they don't go to the bathroom enough. The ultralight backpackers are like Formula One race cars. If you add a kilo of fuel, that's two or three extra seconds per lap. If you're not going to the bathroom every 10, 12 minutes, you're carrying all that extra weight on you. What's the point of even going ultralight backpacking? You might as well bring some big old frame pack or just push a wheelbarrow if you're not willing to be that dedicated to the ultralight community. So maybe that's another one that I need to do. Uh, I'm not sure, still running through some ideas in my head. If you have some ideas, leave them in the comments. But um, again, hope you enjoyed this video and um, maybe I'll see you out on the trail one day. Um, maybe not. So maybe I will see you out on the trail someday and um, hopefully we could connect and, and talk more about this ultralight backpacking thing. I mean, the reality is we'll probably both be moving so fast that we wouldn't be able to talk much. You probably just have like, I don't know, three or four seconds as we're crossing. Um, but maybe, you know, we, we can develop a signal to at least know that we're on the same wavelength. Like, you know, like ultralight something, you, ultra light, something like that. So uh, enjoy your time outdoors and uh, I'll catch you in the next video.